Uh, gentlemen, we are uh, now uh, doing a uh, panel discussion, and we'll just simply try to look at where is the state of IT security from the 15, or I would say 50,000 feet. And I would uh, welcome up on the stage uh, Vitautas Butrimas, uh, please come up. Uh, Lars Hilse, please come up. Chester, is Chester in the room? Okay, he, he should be here in a minute. Oh, yeah, good one, good one, come up. And, uh, and is, there, is there anybody else in the room I, I, I should be having here but I don't see currently? Okay, right guys, uh, just, just take your seats. Uh, just be comfortable. Yeah, those, 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 those three ones, and I will be probably standing. Just uh, be as comfortable as you can. Uh, it's uh, it, it's it's. Uh, people probably had uh, quite a lot of questions, you know. But uh, sometimes they ask them. Sometimes we simply do not have time to to uh, to express our own opinion in a slow manner. Just discussing some of these issues. So uh, I, would, I would pass you the microphones, uh, so you can, uh, okay, try uh, switching it on. Uh, if, if, you, if you need the water or help with the water, I would be uh, uh, happy to help you with a fresh uh, bottle, okay? And uh, if, you, if you got your microphones on, maybe, maybe we can start with you just uh, for the purpose of the recording of, of the panel discussion with you as simply stating a couple of sentences, who do you are and what do you do on everyday case? Sure, uh, my name is Chester Vishnevsky. I'm the principal research scientist at Sophos and my job is to do the kind of big picture security research that uh, a lot of our analysts don't get to do. So my job is kind of knit together all the things that all of our smart people do and put it into one picture to try to see where things are going. Yes, uh, my name is Vitotas Butrimas. I work for the NATO Energy Security Center of Excellence. I'm a subject matter ex expert on the cybersecurity of industrial control systems. Uh, I'm Lars Hilzer, and I have no idea what I'm doing here. No, seriously, um, <laughs> uh, somebody um, once thought I had a few good ideas on the topic of cybersecurity and built up on that. And um, then somebody coined the term global thought leader on the topic and I've been using that ever since. So my uh, research is mainly um, in cyber crime and cyber terrorism, but also uh, in a substantial part in cyber defense. And uh, those are the topics that I cover. Okay, so, so basically, if I could say in a simplified way, so you mostly monitor what, what, what's going on and you see some trends and tendencies and, and you, you work with the NATO to help uh, inter international safety in, in, in terms of uh, uh, technical devices, vulnerable infrastructure, etc. And you uh, do research and, and, and probably maybe work with the, with the, with the customers and, and, and see what, what they are facing. Would, would, would that be correct if, if we simplify it just like that? Yeah, very broadly. But, okay. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So my 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 goal for today's panel was uh, just to simply and quickly share uh, the view from 50,000 feet at the state of IT security. And on one hand, we have some like chaos, and on the other hand, we have uh, an absolute order. Now, how would you how would you express the the state of IT security, the good versus the bad? Is it in the orderly manner? Are we controlling that? Do parties play uh, by the rules, etc.? cetera? Yeah, you, Start you, with you, me? You, I, yeah, I mean, it would be great. It, Thank it, you. It's, as you say, for the 50,000 foot view is kind of hard to see sometimes because we get caught up in what's happening to us in the moment and we don't yeah. think about the, the bigger picture. I mean, I, I'm not bold enough to think that we're getting ahead but I feel like we're making a lot of progress. And I mentioned that when I spoke earlier today on the stage here, and I'm really confident in that, that um, we're now seeing direct reactions to the things we're doing. We're forcing the adversary to change their game. And I don't think we were that, for many years, I don't think we were organized enough or effective enough in what we were doing 
to notice the criminals or governments or others who may be the adversary of different organizations to actually force them to uh, uh, change. And when we're forcing them to change, we're increasing the cost of playing the game for them. And I think that's the direction we have to keep going. So I think we're making progress, but sadly, I don't know that we're organized well enough yet uh, to really say that we're winning in any meaningful way. But um, we're such an immature industry that I think we're just starting to have some success to figure out what, what might be effective so we can keep doing okay. more of it. So we have better visibility and we are better organized in, in, in just combining some, some, some forces or software or some monitoring. Well, and, and through all kinds of groups, uh, I know a lot of mentions in the previous talk of uh, Anissa here in yeah. Europe, and there's, there's much more coordination, uh, both in the private sector, the public sector, there's, there's been efforts made and they're starting to yield some results. It's not uh, for naught. Right. Okay. But are we not an industry that is obsolete in itself if the software companies are doing their jobs right? Yeah, one thing is uh, software companies, obviously, but uh, the, there are people, legislation, uh, it all has to work combined. Sure, but, um, you know, if, I think um, if we were to take one step back and look at it maybe from 55,000 feet rather than 50,000, I think we come to the common denominator that um, whatever we uh, end up fixing is a problem that shouldn't be there in the first place. So uh, I started writing a paper about that three years ago and I got bashed by um, a variety of companies uh, and uh, started to publish or started to pre-publish it and share it with a few people. And they were like, you can't say this in public, you know? Um, uh, and I was like, well, yeah, but look, it was cute when we had grandma's cookie recipes on our Windows XP machines, but now these machines are controlling very, very, very critical infrastructure. So I think, you know, really shouldn't the uh, software companies uh, and um, uh, the problem originators be getting their act together and uh, try to figure out to drop software and hardware that is in itself secure or more secure than it is. Because I think if we don't reach that stage, we shouldn't carry on um, developing the internet further. Just a few uh, months ago, I spoke, um, uh, spoke with uh, one of the guys on the team of Jeremy Rifkin, who's a very uh, high level advisor, amongst others, to Angela Merkel and the European Union and China and whatnot. Um, speaking about what he calls the transportation internet and the energy internet. And um, I told his guy, I was like, look, you know, shouldn't we look at the internet we have right now and uh, get rid of all of the mistakes we've made, take a break and make a lessons learned and then start speaking about these things rather than, you know, carrying on with this flawed product that we have and uh, making it even more susceptible to catastrophic disasters? And um, the answer was, yeah, uh, maybe, but there's no real thought behind it. You know, all of these futurists are pushing and pushing and pushing this thing forward. And I think it's time that we say, okay, let's take a break. Let's see how we can make the further, the, the, the uh, development uh, in the process better. Okay, good one, good one. Okay, we, we have a new person joined us, uh, Brian. Uh, okay, could you, could you, in a couple of sentences, just say who you are, what do you do on an everyday basis? And, and Yeah, and so uh, Brian Geraldo, uh, Vice President of Services for the Office of the CTO for Fidelis, um, and I run services for Fidelis globally. Um, uh, to, I think, I agree with your perspective I, I do, from a theoretical point of view, I really do. Um, but in practice, the way the world works, it would be that we would have to, you know, software companies oftentimes build software and it's more like they're building the plane as it's being flown. Um, you're never gonna be able to get everybody to agree to stop what they're doing so that we can design things in a better way. Control system vendors, um, you know, operation reliability is always going, and availability is always going to supersede any security. You can even, when you look at them and you talk to them about the various tools and protocols that they're using, they don't even sometimes include CRC checking because they're worried that it's gonna stop the millisecond of information that they need to make a decision. So, I under, again, I do understand what you're saying, but I think it, it you know, it, the, uh, we have to work with the tools that we have now and the, and the efforts that we're making, and, and I think what we have to do is honestly, it is, it's a slow effort to change the mindset of people to do software secure development. 
Right. Uh, uh, oh, don't worry. Um, mm -hmm. So wouldn't it be rather, um, you know, just a theoretical approach, but as soon as we were to uh, roll out legislature um, that puts, that makes uh, software vendors liable for products, for faulty products that they put out, I think that would increase the pressure, you know, even if it's just a little bit, that would lead to... Uh, yeah, but it's, the, it's again, it's, it's the process. It's mitigating sure, risks. I get but it totally, anyway, but uh, Lars, I, I have to give the word to Vitautas. Uh, he hasn't <laughs> spoken yet on, on, the, on the subject. Vitautas, could, could you help me just to paint the stage in, 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 well, in your... First uh, of all, I feel very strange uh, sitting here. Uh, I think you might have n noticed that I introduced myself as a industrial control system cybersecurity subject yeah. matter expert. Uh, in, in the IT security area, I think, you know, a lot has been done. I mean, it's a big fight out there. A lot has been done. But the industrial side is maybe 10 years behind, right. maybe even more. And, and uh, we, we went through these uh, European Union cybersecurity law, and, and uh, if I've contributed, I'm a member of an ENISA experts group on the, in the industry for all in the industrial internet of things. The OSE has put out a document on it. And my contribution has been to take what is an IT document, IT biased document, you know, where confidentiality is the first priority yeah. and put industrial control system security language in it where safety is the priority, and then availability is, is the next priority, and confidentiality is at the end. And, 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 and I think uh, we're missing the boat. And uh, I have a very good story uh, uh, about nine, 10 years ago, how I got started on this control system uh, uh, journey. I was asked to write an article for a research institution on cybersecurity and energy. I said, Piece of cake, no problem. You know, 20 years experience in IT, uh, I, you know, working with Lithuania, joining the NATO, InfoSec, ComSec, all that. And I started writing the article. And then I realized, wait a minute, what is this SCADA here? What is this program logic controller here? You know, I realized I did not know even half of what I needed to write a decent article. And it's the title of my presentation today, the cybersecurity dimension mm -hmm. of critical energy infrastructure. I had to go to the natural gas pipeline operators, uh, electrical grid operators, and I found out they are in a different world. They've never heard of Stuxnet. They never heard of the WannaCry. You know, uh, it, they're, they're doing their job. They're kind of isolated, but they don't realize that they have become a target. And if uh, applying the IT best practices is not enough to secure those systems. Yeah. So, so this is where you know, I feel very, very much out of place. You know, I, I'm sort of, you know, my IT colleagues back home, they look at me as kind of like you know, the Lone Ranger. Um, and, and it's because I've been to this other world. And, and, and I'm, I'm trying now when I make these presentations is to raise the awareness to say there is a difference between IT OT and industrial control systems, uh, if you don't know the differences, if you lump everything into SCADA, you're gonna make bad policy. And, and uh, I, 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 I was on the work group that prepared Lithuania's uh, cybersecurity law. And I fought and fought and fought with my IT colleagues who were writing this document. I said, we've gotta talk about process control. And they said to me, what the hell are you talking about process control? It was just an alien concept. And I fought and fought to put the word SCADA into the uh, uh, definition section of the law. But they, I said, but you've got to follow up and put it in the other parts of the law. And they said, that's okay. We call it critical information infrastructure, and it's covered. And now we find that we need to redo the law. It's not covered. Critical information infrastructure is critical, but it's not about information. It's not about the data, it's about a physical process. That's what we're talking about, process control, industrial control systems. It's a different way of doing things. In IT, you're trying to, the operation is to protect the data in, or, or the information. In industrial control system, the operation is to protect the operation. 
Yeah, I, I think so, that you, uh, uh, I was uh, just gonna. One sec. Sure. So what, what are you telling is, is there's uh, plenty of, let's say, sitting ducks and there hasn't been enough wake up calls uh, to, 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 for shareholders to understand that this is uh, one of the most critical areas that needs to be protected and we are going to see uh, much more attacks on this. Well, we're already seeing attacks. I mean, you've been doing this for 10 years. I've been testing these systems for 14 years in control system environments when it was 264 Unix um, running on serial ports, right? Um, the thing is this, right? You can change laws. In, you know, we have cyber insurance now. You know, I've had actually clients that say, I will pay the cyber insurance in critical infrastructure as opposed to actually dealing with the actual fallout of changing my entire infrastructure. It's a terrible approach, but they do it. When you're talking about the issues with policy, you need to address the vendors. Because the biggest, one of the biggest issues, and he points this out very well, the vendors create software that oftentimes has inherent vulnerabilities because they want to maintain operational reliability above, and it's paramount above anything else. If you can't get the vendors involved in this, then your laws are pyrrhic victories at this point. There are laws that are not, they're not gonna be fully implementable in the environment based on what's going on right now. I'm just letting you know, and, and so hopefully that, may, you know, this is what I've been seeing, so, and hopefully that makes sense. So. Yeah, but mm. where, where yes. is the demand and supply in, the, in, in, in this sense? I mean, the vendors would be happy to, to make new software to sell more, uh, sure. but, but, but there must be a demand. Yeah, for, well, for, um, being the co-founder of a cyber insurance startup in Germany, um, we don't insure burning houses, and that's the situation that we're at, right? Um, and uh, I think that's why all of the insurance companies, the US-based ones, are way more advanced than the ones in Europe are, but nobody's signing this stuff. I came in with a, uh, with, with a client who was desperately trying to get an insurance policy, and they were running um, an e-commerce operation, and uh, I took it to the insurance companies and said, look, you know, will you sign this? And they were like, hell no. You know, um, we, we don't know anything about this. And uh, plus, oh, all of these security issues. I convinced them later on because the prime argument was, well, yeah, you know, what happens if the website goes down? And I'm like, yes, the same thing as if the factory burns down of the uh, other company that you have signed up. Um, but even there, there's this distance to this entire field. And um, the arguments you get are just plain cool. You know, some of the stuff that you get, uh, that, that, that you get there. Right. Talk about cyber insurance. There's a very, very interesting case with a Swiss uh, insurance provider in Switzerland. A utility company took out cyber insurance and they got hit with NotPetya very badly. You're talking millions of dollars. You know, it's like the Maersk shipping company uh, also. And the reply from the insurance company was, uh, well, according to the fine print, if this attack was from a state, uh, we don't pay. We're, we're not liable. Well, yeah, I, I talked to your colleague about this about two years ago, and I said, look, you know, hey, shall we not maybe discuss uh, the, uh, an altercation of, um, uh, of the NATO Carta? Because right now, that's one of the primary issues we have in the insurance industry is that anything by a state actor or war or warlike scenarios is what it's called, are, cl are categorically denied uh, or excluded from claims. And um, he was like, yeah, well, let's talk about this because and my core argument was, you know, how are you gonna invoke Article 5 um, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't have any documentation about this? You know, how, how, are, we gonna, how are we gonna get there? Um, <laughs> I think there's a lot of work to do, um, really, uh, on, on that stance alone. There is a great deal of work, and by the way, I do not speak for NATO. I'm, I'm speaking for myself uh, as, as someone who works for a NATO accredited institution, so what I'm saying is not the official policy of NATO. But what's missing, again, uh, in these documents that I read and go over is, you know, they're very good on the hacker threat. How do we deal with the hacker threat? A cyber crime. But when it comes to the, the one threat actor that can do the most damage, that has the intelligence capabilities, the resources, all the 007s and the Qs, it's kind of like, you know, don't talk about it. Uh, I listened to an interview by the head of Interpol and also Europol says the same thing. 
uh, they were given a question, well, in, in your uh, cybercrime investigations, what happens uh, when you see, the, you know, is this like maybe a state activity? Oh, we drop the case. If there's a state, uh, evidence of state activity, we drop the investigation. Yeah. So that raises state the question, go, uh, who takes state. the case? Yeah. Nobody. It, it has to be based on regulation. Yeah, who's so, the plaintiff? And, that's a carte blanche for every criminal. You know, you make the attack look like that it's from a state actor, uh, and you know that you're not going to be pursued by any... That, that's pretty cool. That's, you know, that's uh, cool or well, but, ignorant. But I don't know. Uh, in that case, the state could deny that. And, uh, sure, and, but, yeah, you know, if Interpol or anyone in that case is not going to pursue um, or, or uh, do an investigation as soon as they learn that it's a state case, you know, that's an open book for for any attacker, any private attacker, to uh, make anything that he does look like a state-sponsored thing. Some, something that I didn't really uh, stress in my presentation, I, I got, uh, perhaps I made it seem like it was easy to cyber attack an industrial control system. Believe me, it is one of the hardest things to do is to attack an industrial control system, to attack a power grid or a, or a petrochemical plant. You can maybe be a script kitty or a hacker. You can maybe you'll plant some ransomware, but you have to go through all the levers of engineering. And I mentioned the safety systems. It is a not an easy thing to do. So when you have an incident where it actually penetrates all those levels, you have to say advanced persistent threat. This is a state. There's no way that you can fake it. And, and uh, you can say it's hard to attribute, but you can at least, if you have the cooperation, attribute the country that's responsible for doing something. You can look at the newspapers and see all these cyber criminals getting arrested and brought to justice. International cooperation is very good, the cybercrime convention and, and all that. But when the states are involved, this cooperation ends because they're acting like children who have these toys, these cyber weapons, and they don't want to hear anything about saying, no, 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 you can't use it. We have to have norms. You, you have to, in peacetime, don't go after other countries' critical infrastructure. This is the real issue, the real problem, the elephant in the room that's not being addressed. Yeah, uh, people with power simply always want more power. Yeah, I mean, I was going to say, I, unfortunately, you didn't see my presentation, but I actually showed uh, us actually breaking into a PLC, testing the PLC, knocking it down, doing the same thing with an RTU, knocking that down. Uh, you know, uh, the thing is this, that used to be the case where it was as hard as you thought it was a long time ago, but the problem is, is that vendors are putting modern operating systems, they're running things over TCP IP, including Modbus, including things like Profipus, DN DNP3, all of these different protocols are now being run on standard modern TCP IP. So the problem is, is that as we escalate and these vendors make things a lot easier, what's also happening is, is that you're making it a lot easier for people to break in. In addition to that, the vendor software out there is oftentimes a lot more readily available. And then if you have access to the actual supervisor workstation or the developers that are creating the real-time maps that are tied to the EMS system, then you can affect things. And it doesn't take that great, that much information. You don't have to knock down a bunch of RTUs if you've caused problems with the real-time database. Um, the only thing I'm saying is, is that it's getting easier because of the fact that we've, the industry has evolved to try to use modern operating systems to make things easier for clients and then for the vendors themselves. Yeah. I, I'm, yes. I'm getting you. So I'm, I'm trying to, to keep this at 50,000 feet. So in, in, in that sense, it's, it's getting easier because they are upgrading close enough to the tools the bad guys are using, they're, so it's doable. They're using the same types of IT tools, you know, yeah. and that's the problem. So, and then that, that makes it a, a big issue. So, yeah. sorry. Okay. Uh, Chester, uh, what, what, I'm, what I'm getting from this conversation is that I've, have this feeling that uh, we are mostly talking about how to improve things, now to how, not how to make them happen. So we are on a good track, and I believe with all the legislation and everything, and the software and the prevention, uh, detection software that is in abundance currently available, and, and I think widely used, we are getting this momentum of, of keeping things right and under control, etc. But it's so closely connected and tied to our available resources, the, the people, the personnel. Uh, how, how long do you think we can sustain that? Well, I think there's a, a big movement in 
all areas of security to try to automate because of the volumes of everything that everyone's seeing, right? Without auto, because the humans are just overwhelmed with trying to keep up yeah. in, almost, in most environments. And yeah. we, we, we are all in firefighting mode already. And yeah. we, we're not even old yet. And when you're in firefighting mode, you're not thinking strategically. Yeah. You're not doing things to actually plan out and get ahead and actually understand or spend the time to assess your risk accurately. Um, to make good decisions. You, in, in fact, and the, that's what the criminals, I mean, in fact, I mean, silly things like, I mean, ransomware is not silly if you get hit with it, but it's not a sophisticated attack. This isn't a difficult thing to do. Anybody can do it. And, but the whole point that the tactics the, the criminals are using are no different than the psychological tactics a salesperson would use to get to buy their software. If you buy it by the next Friday, I can give you 30% off. I'm trying to cut, trying to make you make a rushed decision before you think yeah. through something, right? If you don't pay the ransom in 72 hours, the photos get it. Right? I mean, these are very similar things and in, in by keeping us under pressure, we make bad decisions and we continue to make mistakes and we're always chasing what was happening yesterday instead of looking forward to what's coming tomorrow. So the construct of the motivation is actually pretty, pretty same and similar to, to, to I, anything else in our world. Yeah, I just think that the organizations are failing their own staff that they're designating as the people responsible for coming up with this protection strategy by not investing in the staff themselves, right? Yeah. Like all the money's being spent on prevention and reaction, prevention and reaction, running around and around because the prison prevention's never perfect. And you know, because the software's flawed, it continues to get exploited. And you know, they're not investing in training those people or uh, spending the money on automation where you might actually get to a point where you now have the time to sit in the room and actually have a tabletop exercise of what's gonna happen to our organization if this happens, yeah. and uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. the key is people. I mean, the, yeah. the, the AI and the machine learning, all these other things have a place to help they with the automation and yeah, with reducing the noise clean. and increasing the signal. Yeah. But if, if the, people, uh, the, the people are a critical component, if it's just the machines will fail. Okay, they are still uh, assisting human decisions. You, uh, well, yeah, absolutely, no. I remember when Deep Blue finally beat Gary Kasparov yeah. at chess. What we don't talk about is the 20 years that's happened since, which is people with computers playing chess now beat the computers. So the only champions are both computers and people together playing each other because the machines can always be beat by a human with a machine and the humans can always be beat by the machine alone. And we realize that together is the only way they're effective moving forward. And it's no different than the work you know, we do in our company and uh, many people in the industry do, right? We're using the AI to help our people identify the place where they can be effective. But the AI is too dumb to do anything about it. Like it helps mm -hmm. us find things that humans are incapable of doing, you know? Half a million malicious files a day, which one do I look at? Yeah, I can't one, find it one. if I gotta go through 500,000 yeah, of them. But the machine can help go, randomly, these 50 yeah. look weird. I don't know what they are, the machine says. Yeah, but, oh, but, okay, but well if you don't know what they are, I'll get a human. Imagine you work in a customs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it, it's basically the which, same thing. Some, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes. Which package friendly. are you going to open and inspect? Yeah, and you, yeah, and you, uh, you've got to narrow it down. And so I think that, that it, it has to be machines and humans cooperating. And we need to invest more in the humans because too many organizations think that just buying another thing is going to solve their problem. And the, meanwhile, they've not been investing in the people that are doing all the work. At least they think they need something. Okay, I need to conclude this. Row. So, so we have uh, one, 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 uh, uh, the last round of. Of, 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 of the comments, uh, without us, uh, can, you, can you elaborate on that? What's, what's missing uh, in this dialogue uh, are the engineers. The engineer who is working on a, a national power grid or, or a pipeline going thousands of kilometers, uh, when he hears Industry 4.0 is coming, management says we're going to put out a lot of sensors we're gonna give these uh, 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 machines the ability to self-configure. Uh, he needs some backup. He needs to have the authority to say, no, not in this physical process, not yet, not until we've tested and, and we've tried it out, that, 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 it, that it works. Uh, his voice is missing. You know, it, it's, it's, a, it's the management in the office, it, it's the uh, vendors with these wonderful, great products, uh, the put it in the cloud, uh, uh, put the, the safety system uh, network onto the office network. The engineer is basically, you know, he doesn't have the backup uh, to go to management and say, no, 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 because I'm responsible for this every day. 
And, and uh, I can see this is not a good thing at this time. This is what's missing from the, from the conversation. And, and until the engineer comes, we're going to have things like what happened with the Boeing 775 MAX. The bad sensors sent bad data to the AI autopilot system, and that pilot system ordered the plane uh, down into the sea, and the pilot, the human guy, uh, lost complete control. The machine took over. I mean, this is like a, a wake-up call. You know, we should have fallen out of bed, uh, but we still need these wake-up calls. Okay, good one. Lars, your final take? I think um, artificial intelligence is probably the coolest contradiction in terms that we've seen in a very long time. Um, I think we're far away from... Uh, having artificial intelligence by definition. Um, we're on a good good road, but I think until we are at a stage where this artificial intelligence uh, has the maturity of at least uh, a, a teenager, yeah. I think we shouldn't let it be in charge of, um, of things which humans are better at. Sure. And um, automation, sure, we need it, uh, and, and everything else, but looking at it from um, uh, from 50,000 feet, I think, uh, yeah, it's um, time to take, uh, make at least a pause, if not take one step back and see, you know, if this internet thing as we have it now, uh, with all its fault and, and uh, you know, issues, is something we should maybe for the future generation of networks that will inevitably join us um, be worth evaluating to at least eradicate the major risks that we have on the internet of today. Good one, good one, I like that. Brian, last in, last out. Last, yeah, so uh, um, I appreciate it. Uh, yeah, last one, first one in, last one out. Uh, so um, I, yeah, I, I, I think for the, the first speaker and I, I, the, first, the, guy, the, the, the person sitting next to you, I, I, I agree with you know, the idea that we have to go and really train. Um, uh, train the staff appropriately so that they understand uh, at a TTP level the behavioral analysis using things like the MITRE attack framework and really train them on how to use that and then use that with augmented tools like um, like machine learning, like AI. And I also agree with the gentleman here, here that, you know, we're far from uh, a reality where this is going to make sense. I mean, you know, what people don't understand is if you have to do these, uh, machine learning is every day training the model. If you've never done data science before, you're training a model, you're, do, you're using some type of decision algorithm to actually t to use that model. And so as a result of that, it's gonna take a combination of both to get us to close the gap right now with what attackers are doing. And so, um, you know, going from a, a vulnerability-centric to a threat-centric model to a, to a detection, you know, focusing on the detection of, of activity that's outside of what we call known uh, you know, unknown unknowns. You're focusing on, or you should be focusing on unknown unknown things that you don't know about and that hasn't been reported in the industry that you do, that could be affecting your environment. And you know, it's going to require vendors. It's going to require um, uh, uh, legislation. It's going to require um, insurance. It's going to require you know regulations. Um, and all of those things are tied to the point where maybe we can get to the same level of as some of the other industries that are already out there that have built the maturity that they need. We're, we shouldn't be as far behind as we are. And I think it's because um, people haven't looked at the uh, cybersecurity industry in the same way as they've looked at other industries. And once they do that, then maybe we can build some appropriate models um, that make sense. Good, thank you, Brian. Thank you, panel. Thank you, guys. Um, uh, enjoyed to have you here. Uh, thank you for thank your you. time. And I think artificial intelligence and machine learning in IT security and uh, is our great next topic for our next year conference. Would you agree? Good one. Okay. Thank you all. Let's uh, give a nice applause to the gentlemen.